Hello, everyone. Welcome to the webinar, How to Launch a Big Idea from Inception to Implementation. I'll be, I'll be your host uh, during the next uh, 30 minutes, and I hope that you enjoy this, this webinar. Before beginning, I'll make a brief introduction of myself. My name is Sergio Luna. I have more than six years in product management, building multilingual personalized customer experiences in the e-commerce and OTT video, uh, both B2B and B2C, across different markets, both in the American continent, EMEA and APAC, um, driving top and bottom line impact. I mainly focused on building zero to one experiences at very early stages of product development, uh, focusing a lot in automation, uh, building self-service capabilities, as well as scaling. Um, I also do career and, and PM mentoring, uh, both inside and outside my, my daily job. And on a personal note, I'm a creative writer, uh, poet, and amateur artist as well. I'm currently a senior product manager in Prime Video at Amazon. All right, so the agenda for today will be a combination of product theory with a bit of a real example of my personal journey building a, a product and scaling that from inception to implementation. I'll first touch a bit on, on mental models, which is a part of product theory. And then I'll walk you through the personal journey of me launching a product through each one of the stages of product development, finalizing on the product launch. And finally, I'll wrap up with uh, three key takeaways from, from this webinar. So let's start talking about mental models. Mental models are a simple representation of reality, of how something works. It's a way of uh, an abstraction of that layer of reality. And as product managers, we rely a lot on, on mental models, even if we don't know it. Sometimes, for instance, we have mental models around uh, prioritization, around product development, around uh, user research, around experimentation. Uh, I think the word can be sometimes called uh, frameworks. It's, it's always having a way of how to make sense of something, right? So it's very important that as product managers, we realize what are our mental models? How do we use them? Uh, there's no single mental model for anything. I don't believe there's a silver bullet for everything. And I think you can exchange and update your mental models as you grow, as you change industries. Uh, I think the important thing here is to at least be aware of what your mental models are and what are the other mental models out there that you could also leverage. There's a quote from Charlie Munger that I'd like to, to share. He's um, one of the co-founders of Berkshire Hathaway with... Um, uh, with Warren Buffett. And basically he says that in order to make sense of, of the world, you don't really need to remember or memorize the facts, but rather you need to understand sort of the structure, how things work. And that way you can relate better on how different aspects of the world work. work. So for instance, he has mental models on drawing from physics, from economics, from psychology that help him to have a better grasp of, of the financial war, which is his speci specialty. So this is a mental model that I like to use of product development. Uh, I did not create this. This is something that I heard in a PM conference some years ago that I thought was, was, was clever, was very simple, and that I've been using since then. And it basically, basically has four different steps, ideation, socialization, MVP or minimum viable product, and then the, the actual product, right? And what is interesting about this model is that each circle, each step sort of overlaps with the next one in the sense that while you are working on the on the ideation, for instance, there will be a moment in which you will start socializing, socializing your idea, but it could be that you go back to ideation, right? So there's a sort of handshake between each stage in which you will then move to the, to the following step and continue the same process, right? So it could be that after socializing your, your idea, you realize, hey, it's not time to build the MVP. Let me go back and socialize again, or let me go back to the ideation phase because I realized that an assumption was, was wrong, right? Uh, so this is like this continue flow between stage and stage that is not really fixed. In reality, it is a bit more intangible. It's not really clear cut. 
Uh, I'll give some examples later on in the presentation, but I really like this mental model as a way to make sense of where in your journey as as, as product manager are, where in the journey as a, a product development your product is, and that will help you identify whether you're ready to go to the next one, you need to stay, or maybe move back to the, to the previous one. So in the first stage, ideation, this is where where the magic happens, as I like to, to say, here's where you start discovering different problems. You start imagining what the uh, solution could look like. Here's where you can do a lot of UX research, speaking with different stakeholders, be very uh, creative on um, defining different hypotheses. I like to see this stage as a like a white canvas where you just go there and, and brainstorm. You can do some whiteboarding sessions. You can... Uh, draw, you can write, you can perform. It's, it's very divergent in the way of um, not really caring where, where all this is going. It's just about generation, generation of different ideas. Uh, I like to set some time aside to, to think, right? Half an hour, one hour, would you really zoom in into a problem and, and try to evaluate, well, what are customers saying? Is there an opportunity to grow the business in this direction? Uh, there are other solutions, products, what are other companies maybe doing? Uh, there's this new te technology called blockchain. Let me go and investigate a bit more and understand it and see how that can help us or not. There are some frameworks available that can help you with the ideation. Uh, one is design thinking, lean startup. Uh, again, these are frameworks or mental models on how to go about generating new ideas that you could also go and, and leverage and take the best out of them. So basically, here's where you start growing from, from zero to maybe not one, but, but to something. As you move into the product development model, you go into a socialization step, where here the idea is to share um, your ideas or your proposals with the world, get different perspectives. Uh, I personally like to put my ideas in writing and start sharing them, even if it's two paragraphs, one paragraph. Uh, realists are very frugal and just try to validate whether you're after something. Uh, maybe someone else is already doing what you're trying to do. Maybe someone else faced the same challenges, but you want to discover that really quickly, really soon, right? Uh, you want to avoid that case where you're already building something, you're relaunching something uh, to then realize that another team uh, already launched something similar or they knew that that wasn't going to work because of XYZ reasons. So no matter how small your idea or how far-fetched your idea looks like, go and share it, right? You can just write an email, one to a few sentences, share it with some close colleague. Say, hey, does it make sense? Let's go. Let's have a coffee chat and, and just discuss a bit further. doesn't have to be very structured. Um, I like to start with my close circle, like my colleagues, like my internal team. And as the idea get some inertia, then start sharing it with broader groups like external teams, international teams, uh, peer product managers, right? That can bring this diverse perspective. Um, the idea is to incorporate their feedback, their inputs, uh, pay close attention to, especially those who disagree with your idea. What are, what are they disagreeing with? What are their arguments? Uh, and try to answer their questions, right? If there's something you cannot answer, uh, then that's a signal that you may need to uh, re-evaluate your idea or maybe you need to dig up more, more information, more data. At the end, they, the objective is to align on what the business problem or problems are and a potential, even if it's not very solid yet, product vision on how to solve it, including some ideas on the MVP, how could the roadmap could look like. And again, there are some collaboration tools that will help you with this socialization that like uh, Google Docs, SharePoint, uh, Slack, there's a lot of them, uh, right? Here's more about being flexible, being quick, and, and gathering that feedback promptly. Once you have that sort of validation or have gathered a lot of inputs, um, then it's time to test your idea in a, in a quickly and a low cost manner. So, when you build the MVP or when you're approaching to build the MVP, you ask the question, what is the problem you're trying to solve? And more importantly, what are the hypotheses that you have that you want to validate? Uh, my recommendation is that during the MVP, you have to collaborate between product development, design teams. You, you should not embrace this individually. Right, you have to call out also what are your assumptions, your risks. There will be a lot of ambiguity during the MVP, and, and that's okay. The, the purpose of the MVP is to uh, dissipate some of that ambiguity, uncertainty, 
and have a higher level of confidence that whatever you're going to build later on um, would have a positive impact, will bring value to your customers, will bring value to the business, right? But in the MVP, you have to balance between quality, frugality, speed. You can invest a lot of time in building something very, very nice, uh, very fancy, but that might take you one year and you don't want to wait that long to validate a hypothesis, right? So how can you be frugal? How can you leverage existing technologies? Do you really need to have a backend service or is there a way where you can sort of um, trade off a bit that quality aspect with the sake of speed, but at the same time validating hypotheses? Um, which is very important to mention in the MVP that your MVP is not your product, right? It will not deliver the value that you expect to customers or to businesses. You need to set clear expectations about that with your stakeholders. And another thing you need to be aware of is success metrics are not the same as hypotheses. You may have 10 different success metrics on how you're going to measure your, your MVP, your product. It could be engagement, conversion, uh, retention, whatever. But maybe the hypothesis at the end is, are customers able to engage with this new type of technology, right? And that's different. Your success metrics will help you uh, answer your hypothesis. But the main thing is you need to be aware of what your hypothesis is. And your hypothesis more often will not be, um, I can drive 10% engagement. It could be, but uh, oftentimes I find it's a bit more higher level, more abstract. Obviously, you need to capture data from your MVP, both quantitatively and qualitatively. Uh, again, going back to um, validate that hypothesis and answer that question. Uh, there are some frameworks also for how to move fast and, and iterate and all that. Uh, agile development is one of them. But again, the, the main idea in the MVP is to figure out what's a minimum feature set that will validate your hypothesis. Uh, how, will you, how are you going to measure it? And go and build it. Lastly, you have the last stage, which is the product or the, or the product launch, where now you go for real, right? You have incorporated incorporated your feedback from the MVP. You've analyzed what are the pain points, what are the must-haves, the should-haves, the, the delighters or nice to have from, from the customers. And you may also reassess what are your priorities in terms of features, all your P0s, P1s, P2s, based on that feedback and, and those learnings. And here, what you will end up doing is uh, having a, a more expensive investment, uh, you'll still have assumptions and risks, but uh, you'll have a higher level of confidence that whatever you're building, whatever the provision you have, is going somewhere. There's some um, alignment, there's some product market fit, you have some validation in that, right? So you're allowed to, to go a bit bigger, think a bit beyond just that MVP. Uh, you can start defining your performance KPIs, inputs, outputs. How do you measure economic performance, which may not be that important or should not be that important during the MVP? And especially, how will you continue measuring throughout time, depending on your product every day, every week, month, or quarter, whether you're adding value or not, and whether you need to stop, pivot, reevaluate, go back maybe to the definition or not. Again, as, as many say, uh, launch is only the beginning. Uh, it, you're far from, from over in the journey, but at least it's uh, one big milestone um, from that zero to one experience on how you want to build something and make sure that that big idea that you have um, resonates with your, with your customers. So now I'm going to shift a bit uh, the mechanics and I'm going to walk you through my journey of launching a big idea from inception to implementation. Uh, and I'll be touching upon each of these four stages of product development, right? But making reflection on, on, on my own experience. And um, to give a, a bit of a spoilers ahead, so this example is how a small idea of building a, a chatbot resulted in building a, a chat platform across multiple countries, across multiple languages, growing a team from uh, a few engineers to uh, almost 10 engineers, including content moderators, um, having funding from different teams, having higher visibility, influencing different parts of the organization, uh, right, and having broader goals in terms of the impact and, and customer experience. So it all started with... Uh, with a question, how can technology help me solve business problems? Uh, before we have very 
manual uh, standardized processes that require a lot of of time. Uh, they were not scalable. They were prone to errors. There was not possible to to learn from those interactions. So, how could we use technology to scale that, to standardize it a bit more, to maybe automate some parts of it, and and bring more value to to our customers and to the company? And I wanted to have a more tech-driven approach towards solution because in the past it was more business-driven. Like, hey, we have this problem. Um, Product manager help us how to solve it. So I wanted to include uh, my engineering team more in this ideation stage. So what I did is that I collected a um, short list of 15 different pain points identified by my business teams, very rough uh, pain points like um, productivity related or hey, our tools are very slow. We need to wait X days. Uh, we're seeing these problems with our customers that we don't know how to solve. So it's very high level, just to get a, a sense of what was business facing. And then I met with my engineering team that back then was based in, in India. And I ran a series of brainstorming sessions uh, where we discussed um, what is the, the business context. I gave them some overview of where the where was the business going, uh, what were the main problems, what were the processes, what were the main key stakeholders, where were the different projects already in motion. And at the same time, there was a different session, uh, a whiteboarding session, where we went one by one, each one of the pain points, and we were exploring what could a solution could be for, for that. We were time boxing the, the discussion. And just to get a, an initial idea of what, what could make sense from a technology point of view. So basically, in other words, this was more meant towards divergent thinking, just write down different ideas and where we saw a bit more of opportunity or more excitement, then we may spend a bit more time there uh, just to flesh out that idea a bit more. After that, the the output of that uh, session was um, a two-pager with a, with a high-level business problem and how the solution could look like. This was very, very... Uh, generic rather than specific. There were two or three ideas that were the best ones based on our own assessments. One of them was uh, to build a chat, uh, a chatbot using specific technology because it, it was a good way to increase uh, customer experience while also scaling our operations, bringing productivity impact, and so on and so forth. And what I did with this two pager was to start socializing that with my internal product team. Then with my brother uh, business team, my reporting line, uh, product peers in different teams, different organizations, uh, with engineering, different engineering groups, and also cross-functional teams that had nothing to do with, with my organization, but just to get that, that feedback. The learning was uh, very important because, uh, one, we realized that no one else was building something similar. There were no in-flight projects. There were no uh, overlaunch launch projects. Uh, in the same dimension. So there was no redundancy in that sense. Uh, two, uh, a lot of people agreed with, um, with the idea, like, okay, this we can see this working, this could uh, work with our uh, line of business, or hey, this sounds good, but cannot really work with our line of business because X, Y, Z reasons. So there was a lot of appetite and, and buying from, from different stakeholders. And, and even though they didn't contribute with... Uh, yeah, I can bring you a, an engineer or a designer to help you with. At least um, I already knew that I could go back with those teams and, and partner in the future once I had launched the MVP and the product uh, because I already got their, their buy-in. And this is very imp uh, important, especially when uh, I went back to my leadership team asking for, for funding. Hey, we need to build this. We need to reprioritize our roadmap. Let's go and build an experiment next year. Uh, it was very important for them to hear that all these other teams and stakeholders were already considered and that they didn't have any, any blockers. So that really uh, accelerated and made that discussion with my leadership. Hey, we have this big idea. We want to start small. Uh, we need this amount of, of, of um, the size of a team. Uh, help us build it. This is the plan. So in other words, the socialization aspect of this um, project also helped coming from a divergent thinking where we were really thinking out loud into something more narrow, more converging into an actual solution uh, with specific look and feel. 
So after socializing my, my idea, um, leadership approved the, the funding of it. And we set on the task to, to define and build uh, the MVP. So <laughs> uh, I think one of the interesting parts here is that uh, at some moment I asked myself the question, well, how do I even build a, a chatbot? How, how do I start by defining the, the scope? I want to deliver value, but also at the same time being frugal. And I also need to build for scale because if this works, how, how are we going to build it in the future uh, at scale, right? Uh, so I went down and I started kind of drafting a, a business requirement uh, with different features, a bit of the vision, the narrative. I ended up building a 20 pages document uh, with a lot of different details on how to go about the, the MVP. Um, I received the feedback from a, one of my senior business stakeholders. Hey, I'm not sure what you want to build. I'm, I'm a bit confused. Like, what, what are we talking about here? And at the same time, as I was discussing this with my tech partners, uh, there was a strong appetite to build complex and fancy features from the onset, like uh, NLP, natural language processing, or machine learning. There was a lot of eagerness to explore those areas of, of technology because they're exciting, right? And they make sense, uh, but from the onset. So um, I had to sort of figure out how to manage, how to solve these, these challenges. For the first one, I, I knew that I had to simplify the, the scope. And what I did was, once again, creating a mental model for that feature set that I didn't have before. And what I realized is that it was way easier to make sense of what I wanted to build and also to communicate that if I could divide the feature sets into four different uh, modules, uh, which I called uh, UI, content, systems, integration, and targeting. And then under each one of those, really specify what are the, the P0 features needed for the, for the MVP, what are the nice to have, the P1, the P2, and so on. For example, at the very beginning, we thought that we had to integrate with some internal systems to auto-generate some tickets and some sort of alarms, and therefore we needed to integrate our app with, with those other applications. But in reality, it turned out that that was not a really P0 feature. Uh, after discussing with the with business team, with the account management team, we realized that there was a way in which that could be a, a semi-automated workflow in which someone could create those tickets manually because that was the business as usual process. And that would have a lot of impact on productivity, uh, but it could help us to move faster and, and avoid investing X weeks on integrating with those systems. We didn't know if there were APIs available and so on. So that was one example of how having that mental model helped me really understand what are the minimum uh, features for each one of these modules. At the same time, uh, it helped me also to better communicate with tech because uh, I was creating the user stories under the lenses of each one of these modules. And what I realized is that uh, at the beginning, NLP and ML was not part of the, of the initial feature set, right? Those were my, more nice to have. But uh, at the same time, what really what I realized is that leading with the product vision of how the product could evolve in the future, and then at some moment uh, start investing on NLP, ML, all these other fancy technologies, really helped my tech team to understand that progression, that evolution, and have their buy-in and say, okay, we're not going to in include any of these fancy technologies, but we know how the pro can evolve. And therefore, here's the best way in which we can design it and also uh, help them to keep them engaged and, 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 and sort of trust in, in, in the product. And, and the idea with this is also change a bit the mindset of not going super big at the beginning, but instead focus more on building proof of concepts, prototypes, and, and see if that works, put that in front of customers, get the feedback, and then keep on iterating, iterating. Again, it's more about raising the level of confidence rather than going crazy from, from the very beginning. So after all this uh, discussion and rescoping of the MVP, at the end, I ended up defining the, the MVP of a chatbot and I'm putting quotes because it was in reality more of an interactive wizard rather than a, a really uh, intelligent, bot-powered uh, chatbot. It was more like a click guided, guided experience uh, but at the end, it turned out to be a, a good option because uh, it allows us to move fast um, 
as opposed to having investing in all these other technologies. So um, once the scope for the MVP was defined, then it was moment of, of developing, right? And one of the things that really helped me to keep track and make sure that everyone was on the on the same page was to designate a core team of uh, of myself, a product, uh, business players, and also tech players who would make all these low-level decisions in terms of how should be the copy here, how should be the copy over there, what type of colors, the UI, things that do not require leadership sign-off because that will uh, slow us down and, and just to move fast, right? So, so it was a very agile team that was meeting uh, once or twice per week and making all these different uh, low-level decisions. Uh, I, I felt that that really helped with the, with the progression. We also have mechanisms for progress updates, uh, weekly, um, uh, by weekly uh, status updates via emails or some other uh, formats just to keep my leadership team aware, uh, tech leadership aware of the progress, what were the different options that we were reviewing and the different decisions as well. And finally, uh, creating a going no go a meeting prior to launch with leadership, with everyone, where we went through the entire um, conception of the product from the UI all the way to how we're going to capture uh, metrics, uh, measure success, uh, which are the customers that we were going to invite to this um, kind of beta program in a way. Uh, and, uh, and the idea there was to get a, a green light, right? And everyone on board it of how the MVP could look like. So then came the moment to, to launch. Um, very important moment in, in a product manager career when you hit the button, okay, let's go live and let's start looking at the results. Um, here, what was very important is to capture that customer feedback, right? Both quantitatively and qualitatively. Uh, I cannot stress how important it is to, to really get close to your customers, to really speak to them. In this case, what I did besides looking at, at the quantitative data, like the behavioral data, uh, I start calling customers and I would have a one hour call, sit with them um, and really share my screen. Hey, this is the experience. Um, what do you think? You're already engaged with it. This was the results. We just want to understand a bit more in detail, in depth. Uh, why did you uh, perform certain actions or, or what do you think when you read this, this specific message? And that gives us a lot of uh, breath in terms of understanding what was the actual interpretation of the customer of that product. Uh, to the most part, it was consistent with what we were seeing in the numbers, but um, it's always very powerful to have an anecdote that tells you, hey, I really like that you're investing in this area. I can see the, the, the potential benefit that this will have in my company. Uh, you're not there yet because you need to invest in content, you need to invest in these other areas, but, uh, but I'm grateful that you're investing in this. Um, let me know if you need something else I can help you with. So it was very valuable to hear that from an actual customer, validating the, the idea in itself and also validating where are the areas that we needed to invest a bit more. Once again, um, one of the big learnings for us or for me was that it was not really clear from the beginning what was the purpose of the MVP. So after we reviewed the the results, we saw high engagement, we saw good conversion, we had positive feedback overall from, from our customers, uh, and we weren't seeing a lot of financial impact, right? And during one meeting where we were reviewing these results, one of my senior uh, business stakeholders asked me the question, hey, why should we continue investing in, in this product if it's not bringing any financial results compared to other initiatives, right? Uh, we invested X amount of time and resources building this, uh, but it's not really moving the needle in our business. Why should we continue investing the, the year that comes? So that was a, a question that I was not expecting and that uh, now I know how to answer or to avoid <laughs> to start with. And, and the answer to that question is that the MVP is not about bringing financial impact, moving the needle, uh, being a game changer, right? Again, the MVP is a way for you to quickly and as a low cost validate the hypotheses, which are different from the success metrics. In my case, one of my hypotheses to validate was, are customers able to engage with this new channel? Because it was something new for them. 
uh, are they even receptive to to this new experience or would they not be touching it at all would they be confused would they have different expectations right and the success metrics help me to answer the question okay if i'm seeing a high engagement it means that yes uh, if I'm, if i'm seeing a good conversion means that well uh, they're even deriving value from it it's not only that they are able to engage with this new experience and then the positive feedback regarding hey i, I like it continue investing in it so so success metrics help you answer that question that hypothesis but it was not really clear from the beginning so i should have done a better work at um setting those expectations right from the upfront when i was creating the, the mvp and i was driving my product vision uh, that was not very clear from the onset so uh after reviewing these results um my recommendation was to continue investing and move away from the mvp and really launch a more compelling product and at that moment i i had to kind of take a few steps back step back and redefine the, the scope, really pay attention to now that I have validated the hypothesis and having some data that supports the argument that this product is, is driving value to customers and potential to a business, what is the long-term vision? So thinking a bit broader, in my case, it was a three-year plan. However, depending on the on the industry, on the, on the product, on the company, uh, that could look at uh, six months or a year, right? And for instance, one of the things that I realized is that this could become a platform rather than just a standalone application in a very uh, niche environment. So how can we build this into a platform involving different capabilities like live chat, uh, some other uh, more fancy things like, as, as we were saying, NLP and, M and machine learning? How can we improve... Uh, uh, what type of content, how can we scale the content generation? So things that you can then continue, go back to the to the to a drawing version is like a mini ideation stage, um, but looking more at the future now that you have a higher level of confidence. In my case, this required aligning with different stakeholders to the same people that I had spoken in the past, and then go back with the results. Hey, this is what we are seeing, this is where we want to go. Uh, and with some of them, I really needed to partner. For instance, there, there were teams that own specific real estate and in the in the gateway in the in the in the online page. So I wanted to inject or embed that chatbot functionality in their real estate, uh, and I needed their collaboration. And one of the challenges that I received was, okay, it sounds good, but how will your product will uh, help me achieve my my goals? I have my own goals that have nothing to do with what you're telling me. So why should I even collaborate with you? How, why should I even share some of my, my bandwidth to help your team, right? And, and that was one of the mistakes that I uh, realized at the beginning where I did not speak that much with those teams up front to really understand why what, what they care for, right? And, and ultimately, after some discussions, it became evident that there was an overlap between our goals, but it was not very evident from the onset. And so one of the things we end up doing here is to figure out how we could have shared goals in which, uh, for instance, my, my, my goal was to um, increase the touch points by embedding this uh, application in a different platform. Whereas for them, um, they were maybe having some goals around latency or how to decrease um, uh, customer contacts, right? And and maybe the, the, the chatbot that our product would help them in that regard, right? So how do I frame the the goals and the features in the way that it helps them to achieve their their goals as well? Um, not all of the teams <laughs> were open at the beginning. Uh, there was some churn, uh, so that's why it's in, that's why it's important to engage with these teams during the so socialization step um, early on. And once in this step, I also decided that I needed to define better and more broader uh, product goals, again, in terms of adoption, engagement, conversion, right? But also in terms of business goals, what are my projections in terms of the revenue or cost savings or productivity impacts that I could have? And that way also align with my business stakeholders and, and have a, a clear understanding of by end of the year, we will achieve this, 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 this much financial impact. 
Uh, this is the customer impact as well. Here's the plan in each month, in each quarter, how we're going to expect it. These are the assumptions. And then have mechanisms to review that. So that way you bring everyone on board. Everyone's in line with your, your plan. And after that, it, quote unquote, only becomes execution and communication of um, the different um, kind of results, learnings that you're having throughout the year. So in conclusion, to wrap up, I have three key takeaways. Uh, the first one is that you want you need to understand what you want to learn from the beginning. You need to be really clear with your hypothesis and you need to make sure that your different stakeholders are aligned with those hypotheses. Again, um, hypothesis is not success metrics, 60% uh, engagement is not a hypothesis. Try to think of what are those more abstract uh, hypotheses, especially when you're thinking about big ideas, things that are groundbreaking, things that didn't exist before, that maybe you don't have any reference point, you don't have a benchmark. So at that moment, you cannot compare success metrics, right? So you need to focus on, I want to experiment this. I want to learn if this is true or not. And here's how we're going to do it. And this is the time frame. So you really need to be clear on those learnings from the onset. The second one is, um, as you grow into your product, especially from when you move from your MVP to the actual launch of the product, you will most likely have to partner with different teams, right? Especially if you are in bigger orgs, if you're working across different domains, different countries, territories, uh, at some moment you will need to partner with these teams. The best way to do that is having shared goals from the onset and bringing them on board from the very beginning so they are aware of what you're planning to do, what you're working on, and also um, ask them for their inputs in that, right? But ultimately, in, in order to drive better um, alignment and collaboration. If you have a shared goal that both teams are responsible for, that will be an intrinsic motivation to um, work well together. And finally, uh, and this is something that I don't see happening that much, is uh, involve your tech teams, your engineering teams, to, to, to that matter, also design teams, right? Uh, in all product development stages, they are your partners they are the ones who can bring a diverse perspective uh, into a business problem, right? Especially if you are in, trying to tackle a, a business use case or a business problem, business opportunity, you want to open a new market, and it's very business-driven, bring on board your tech team. Um, give them some context of, of, of the PL, the, the, the different problems that business is facing, and open the conversation to what would you do from a technology point of view, what is out there that you believe could, could help us, uh, they will bring some ideas that you had never thought of. Uh, believe me, that that's for sure. Uh, try to change also mindset. Let's build quick prototypes. Uh, let's do something very frugal. Uh, let's build some wireframes some mockups and just put that in front of, of customers and then try to get that early feedback. But again, uh, bring them on board from the beginning ideation. They're very, a very good partner to bring new ideas. Uh, also, while you're defining your MVP scope and all of that, they will help you tell you what is possible, what is feasible, what is the cost, a better way of doing it, right? So you don't have to do it on your own. And all in all, when, when you're trying to, to build a, a big idea and move from inception to, to, to implementation, I think a lot has to do with be really uh, bold with your vision try to influence teams with, with that uh, provision that you have, how it could look like, leverage visuals, leverage uh, data, anecdotes, and keep on iterating on top of that as you learn more, as you get more feedback from your customers, right? Um, I think when we're talking about big ideas that by definition may be game changers or no one has seen them before, it's very difficult for different stakeholders to really understand what they're about and what their impact will be. So you really need to invest time on, on, on that uh, sort of narrative, that storytelling of how this could become something big. And as you move on, add, add and more data, either quantitative or qualitative. And, and again, over-indexing communication, make sure that everyone's on the same page and just share the results. 
right? And never forget to also involve your, your customers and speak with them directly uh, at every stage of the process. Never assume that the numbers that you're seeing tell the full story because sometimes an anecdote can surface things that the data will not tell you and that may made you reconsider, change your strategy or, or pivoting. All right. So I hope that this webinar was useful and that you were able to at least um, take one or two things out of it. Uh, I'm happy to read, uh, I'm happy to engage with, with anyone who wants to connect with me. I'm available on LinkedIn. So reach out to, to me in case you, you have any question. I'm always happy to, to start different conversations with um, different people. So Again, thanks for, for your time. Hope it was uh, helpful. Uh, have a good rest of the day and talk to you soon. Thank you.